Okay, so welcome. Um, today I'm going to be talking with Janaki Jagannath, who's a friend of mine who's currently based in Davis, California, um, and has done a lot of different stuff around uh, food systems uh, and food system change. And so I've invited her to talk about um, mostly about her own work and path, but also some of these concepts, uh, sort of baseline concepts and what food movements focused on the US, but of course in an international context are all about. Um, so Janaki, I guess the first question is just, you know, tell us a little about, you know, how you came to arrive in this kind of work uh, in the first place. Thanks, Antonio. And it's such a pleasure to talk on a, uh, a recorded lecture for a bunch of students because I just recently graduated from law school. I guess it feels recent because it was in the spring of 2020 that went by in a flash, but um, I did my last quarter of law school at UC Davis School of Law, primarily on Zoom. So I am familiar with how mind numbing it can be to be on uh, Zoom classes. So props to everybody who's watching this and, and um, staying engaged in, in your uh, university classes right now. Um, so I, um, like Antonio said, have been involved in many different areas of kind of food systems work for uh, 10 years now. Um, I started out in this whole uh, understanding of agriculture and food systems as a farmer. And I'm uh, originally, well, I was born in Alabama and my parents both immigrated from South India. My dad worked in paper mills growing up and I moved around the South to little, from little rural town to little rural town. And um, when my parents divorced, my mom raised me and my brother in North County, San Diego in a relatively rural area. And um, I, our first friends upon moving to California were a uh, family, a Japanese American family farm called the Chino family farm, which is um, a 47 acre diversified vegetable operation that still operates using just very traditional practices in the sense that it's all cash based. We don't have any, um, like um, we don't have a CSA program or anything like that. Everybody just comes and buys their fruits and vegetables direct from the stand. And the farm itself is located on land that previously, you know, it belonged to the Chino family um, since they purchased it before World War II, but like with many uh, Japanese and Japanese American families and their legacy land, their land had been um, entrusted into the hands of uh, a white friend at the time who, um, at the time of Japanese internment and their land ended up getting sold, but because of their um, ability for economic resilience, just being able to um, continue to uh, make enough money to buy that land back, they were able to purchase it back. And over the course of the, um, the time between World War II and you know the early nineties, the land prices around that farm raised so much to the point that they had a really stellar market for their fruits and vegetables that they were able to um, sell it. Uh, really expensive lettuce and really expensive oranges. And, you know, just like, it's kind of a fantasy of an agricultural operation in the sense that people like some of the top chefs of the area would just come in um, and I would, you know, cut the season's best tomatoes for Alice Waters behind the shed and Wolfgang Puck would come down and harvest raspberries with his son in our field. You know, it's like unlike any kind of farming experience um, I've ever had subsequently. So all that is to say that I had a very rosy perspective of what agriculture could be, both because of the um, the socio the sociological anomaly of that farm, the historical anomaly of that farm, and the economic anomaly that it continues to be. And uh, I went to school at UC Davis for agriculture, thinking I was going to go back and and continue farming there. Um, and sort of became politicized and aware of the realities of, um, of farm worker life when I was at, at, uh, at school at UC Davis. And, um, you know, it goes, it doesn't, it, 
it goes without saying that as a somebody who worked at that farm growing up, I was exposed uh, intimately to the realities that um, despite whatever sort of niche of organic or specialty agriculture that a farm might be in still relies on migrant labor. And there's just no two ways around it. You know, and sometimes there are farms, you know, now in, in, tw in 2020 that are operated by one or two people or that are largely mechanized, but the majority of our diversified uh, farming in California still relies on, uh, on uh, migrant labor. And um, at that farm, it was mainly Oaxacan migrants. So something that is uh, still relatively unknown to many is that the, the largest growing segment of the farm worker population in California are indigenous people from Oaxaca who speak several different languages outside of Spanish, a few of them being Mixteco, Zapoteco, Triqui, um, and other languages that are sort of within those different regional languages. And um, so I was exposed to the, the cult, that cultural nuance that is a crew that was primarily Oaxacan and who spoke Mixteco. So um, that exposure at the farm and going to school kind of raised my awareness around the intersection of agriculture, labor, and environmental justice, and the reality that continues to face most farm workers, which is that you know the farm worker life expectancy continues to hover around 54 years for um, for a male farm worker uh, of, <clears throat> of average health in California, and that's not a coincidence, right? I mean that agriculture is so much a product of um, a specific design that was developed over the course of time, experimented by private industry, by the University of California, um, you know, to sort of reach these peaks of, uh, of productivity. And um, this is sort of a roundabout way of saying that it took me a long time to sort of arrive at the realization that the no small farming experience or isolated farming experience can truly allow a person to see the larger tapestry that upholds agriculture in, in our state, one of the most productive states in the United States as far as agricultural output goes. Um, can I ask I have a quick, just a question on this um, sort of that realization because you had this experience early and then was it like certain ideals and in, in your schooling that like sort of expanded out the systemic lens or like how did how did you come to that kind of realization? Um, yeah, I'm curious, like what, yeah, what, I, what, what sort of uh, inputs, you know, led to that, to that expansion of, of, of recognition that it wasn't as simple as like, oh, a small ecological farm is great. Definitely a certain set of professors and um, two people in particular, you know, Ryan Galt and Mark Van Horn, who um, both in different areas of the uh, sustainable ag education um, faculty at UC Davis respectively started a food systems class and uh, ran the student farm. So Ryan was a professor of, of the food systems course, which is the first one I ever took to, to talk about the food system, to analyze the food system. And uh, Mark being somebody who um, was an educator around organic and uh, ecological agriculture for many, many years. And both of them sort of in their uh, respective paradigms uh, of approaching ecological agriculture really stressed like rather than just reading all these books and data points in order to capture um, the state of agriculture in California, they both really stressed uh, internal self uh, self analysis as a way to achieve this kind of broader systemic understanding. And by that, I mean, really challenging us to look through different lenses, to seriously read like Paulo Freire, to read um, feminist writers, to, to sort of do, do these kind of a philosophical journey, and then to utilize those different frameworks to view, to go to a farm and think like, what, what does this uh, pedagogy or this 
particular uh, framework through which to look at this. How does this change the way that I view this farm? Mm. A farm which to one person may look like beautiful and productive, clean, uh, high yielding, and to another person, the same exact farm can look like uh, a space that is sacrificial, that's polluting, that's resulting in economic decline, that's hurting certain people physically, emotionally, socially. Um, so without sort of that um, self-analysis, and I guess when we look at um, specifically Paulo Freire as, a, as a, a teacher in this area, this idea of like, of self-education and self-awareness as a, the first step into stepping into activism, mm. that's truly kind of the, I guess, the approach that these professors took that set that, I think it really sets the uh, agricultural education that I received apart from mm. simply just, you know, reading uh, books by Michael Pollan, which are obviously wonderful in their own context, but don't sort of just reading sort of the current data points around mm. the state of agriculture. It's not always the, the most direct way to um, do what Cesar Chavez called the education of the heart you know, rather than just simply the education of the mind. Mm -hmm. It also doesn't necessarily like lead you to strategies or ideas for the transformation of those problems you you seek, right? You read right. about, it doesn't tell you anything about what your heart says about possibilities and connecting with people, you know, right. personally. Yeah, and, and I'd just like to add that, you know, in terms of the ag education experience that I got, I was also invited to help craft the sustainable agriculture degree at UC Davis. And I didn't get to graduate in that degree, but it was created and uh, certified the year that I graduated um, from UC Davis. And to me, the involvement of students in the, the sort of like process of developing um, classes and pedagogy is truly powerful because I've never been good at school. You know, I've never been high achieving in terms of I never gotten great grades, but I had professors that were able to see that, you know, I had something to offer in terms of the way that I view things and and that the engaging students in that sort of um, in self um, rather than just using grades and this banking form of education to actually you uh, engage students in self analysis and um, building competencies rather than just grades truly was uh, was really formational for me. Um, so, so then, like coming out of that program, which you know wasn't fully formed when you were taking it in terms of this new major they have, but um, did you feel like, oh, now I have a new path of sort of what I want to do to address food systems issues that wasn't just going back to farm on this nice plot mm -hmm. of land. Yeah, yeah, it really did. And um, although like right after school, I did just go back and farm for a couple of years because that was what um, I had things going on in my family that required my presence at home. And that was what I was doing at the time was farming. I did through process of this kind of politicization self-awareness, building a recognition of um, the political ecology of agriculture, which I now understand as agroecology, mm -hmm. was that, um, you know, my, that the law and the way that, the way that agriculture is or is not regulated or does or does not participate in the regulatory process is as much a part of the eco the ecology of a farming system as the pest management scheme, the soil health, the weather, the market conditions, the labor, uh, all of those things are as important as you know the way that the law functions on, on, on that land to either impact it or not to impact it. And I would really say that um, that's kind of the reason why I continued, I began and continue to use agroecology as a movement framework for myself is that it allows for a vast 
conceptualization of these different aspects of a farming system that are not always what you're taught in ag school. Mm -hmm. And it's certainly not what you're always exposed to as being the factors that lead to a farm looking the way that it does. Very rarely do, um, do, do we as people from the ag sciences um, necessarily look at the history of a piece of land as a being an important uh, part of the way that its soil biota look like. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, and then we may look at geologic history, we may look at the hydro hydrologic history, mm -hmm. but do we look at who owned that land when it was colonized, who it was stolen from, who has had access to it as a, as a way of understanding how uh, water percolates through the, through the strata? Mm -hmm. Hardly. So to me, Truly, it was like um, uh, I had that moment um, when I moved back after going to after being in school and moving back and farming for a while. That I um, was really I was fascinated, and it was really important for me to be more involved in understanding um, the law. And my my first entry point into that was doing farm worker legal services and. There was a, a person who came, and I remember this, this woman who was actually a judge in Southern California mm. who would come to the farm and she would buy figs from us, uh, these like really delicious strawberry figs that we would sell at a certain time of the year. And um, she'd come and do the same thing every time we sold them for like $8 for like a little half crate. Uh -huh. And she'd be like, no, I'm not going to buy these for $8 and be like, all right, like I'll, I'll give them to you for four if you come and talk with me about, you know, you're like, about the law, <laughs> talk, talk to me about basically like, give me the lowdown on what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just became sort of like an informal, like sort of a joke thing. She knew that I was interested in this stuff and mm -hmm. she would sit with me behind the stand and um, eat figs and just talk to me about uh, the, the work that she was doing in, in immigration and farm worker services. And at some point, I remember she told me, like, you know, Janaki, you don't have to have a law degree to work in legal services. You just have to have your head on straight and have your heart in the right place and just apply for something and, and try it out. And I ended up applying to um, work in Fresno to be in um, as a community worker, which is what it's called at California Rural Legal Assistance, where I had my first position. Uh, a community worker, meaning a person who's essentially like a paralegal, but um, you also do field work in the sense that, you know, when you're doing rural legal services, it's very hard for farm workers to come to your office and um, to gather the facts and, you know, uh, do the discovery and so forth. So a good chunk of what um, I was doing in that role was going out to the field, surveying the field, taking a set of binoculars and checking to see who like were, were there sufficient um, porta potties and people have access to water and shade and things like that. Mm. And talking to people through the fence sometimes like through the grapevines, literally through the grapevines yeah, yeah. about what was- You heard it through the grapevine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, honestly, so that was, just, that work was, my first experience in doing actual legal services for farm workers. Mm -hmm. And again, I was surrounded by you know, Oaxaca and indigenous farm workers for the most part. And, you know, San Diego to Fresno, to any place that's growing fruit and vegetables, you're gonna encounter the same issues mm -hmm. in some regions worse than others. And in Fresno by far, some of the worst um, in terms of the environmental degradation that residents deal with there. Just wondering, had you known like about, because you know, you say you can find these issues everywhere, say in California, um, but did you know about sort of the specifics or the differences of the Valley's like history and politics in contrast to say where you're from when you went there or did you discover things through the process or both? Um, I definitely knew a bit, but I had never like lived in the Valley before. And I certainly didn't have an understanding of the lived reality of um, dealing with 
like 111 degree summers and um, the kind of air quality that causes asthma attacks and the groundwater quality that results in like widespread birth defects. And like, these are not things that I was exposed to specifically before. I had a generalized understanding of the disparity that the Valley face, mainly because um, one doesn't really study the food system in California without understanding that the San Joaquin Valley is the site of both the most productive agricultural counties in the United States and also some of the poorest and most socially disadvantaged areas um, in the United States that in terms of human development index, you know, meaning educational attainment, income, um, chronic illness outcomes that we're the San Joaquin Valley is uh, on par with many regions of Appalachia, which are understood in, you know, in the rest of the United States as being the poorest places in, in the whole country. So I, of course, had that, again, sort of just as a data point, but I didn't have the kind of heart knowledge of what that truly meant or what, um, what actually needed to be done to help shift some of those outcomes. And at California Rural Legal Assistance, I was a part, um, I helped run a program called the Community Equity Initiative that was focused on um, community-wide cases. So this is not just the kind of individual cases related to wage theft and sexual harassment and pesticide exposure, which um, also I participated in, but really looking at um, the community-wide impacts of agriculture, talking about like a polluted groundwater system or rates that were too expensive for residents to pay because the groundwater is, or um, surface water rather, is governed by, uh, uh, for instance, a board of an irrigation district that are only landowners, so farm workers can't participate. You know, kind of complex legal issues that plague only farm workers, and they always happen outside of outside of the sight of most people in metropolitan areas. Mm -hmm. And it's my understanding as somebody who has worked in these areas, these dusty, forgotten, uh, dust bowl communities, really, mm -hmm. that if they were more, if, if they were brought to greater light in metropolitan areas, there would be outrage about them. I mean, the, the idea that there could be over a million people that lack access to potable drinking water every year in California, um, that, you know, there are pesticide exposures that result in a uh, vast uh, over um, the, an experience of autism and birth defects among farm worker community schools that are far above what any, anyone else in the state experiences. These are disparities that are hard to ignore. And it's my understanding that they would not be ignored if they were not so distant, truly geographically remote. And- um, But also like, like distant in terms of not being discussed. I mean, I was thinking back to like the Michael Pollan book, right? That status quo of sort of what constitutes analysis of the food system doesn't usually keep these kinds of issues in mind, or if it does, it's in the register more of like the poor individual farm worker who faces some sort of issue or like the farm should treat the farm worker better, mm -hmm. you know, thing which I was thinking like you were talking about um, kind of seeing that whole agroecology, including what in permaculture they call invisible structures, mm -hmm. the idea that there's invisible structures that, right, they're not physical things, but the law economics, the way the political system works, the way these water boards operate. These are things that are not visible, um, but they are structuring all of these conditions. And that those, I think that there's a lot about the way those invisible structures are not seen that make it harder to imagine um, why these things are the way that they are. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that the, um... In general, you know, speaking as somebody who has been through the uh, three years of law school that I've been through, the administrative process around environmental law is so opaque to just the average person, you know, let alone somebody who is working on, in a stooped position for 14 hours of the day 
dealing with health crises and a lack of access to drinking water. To, and to think that, you know, it's really those people who are dealing with those challenges who have to be advocating for themselves and have to be at these meetings and um, have to be, uh, not only carve a space for themselves at the table, but then sit at that table with, with government officials who are involved in, uh, in those regulatory processes. It's a, it's a true unfairness. It's a true unfairness that causes this kind of uh, disparity in who, who experiences the worst outcome of climate change and environmental degradation. Um, because the, yeah, the, the environmental legal process is anything but fun. I mean, it's the most dry, boring thing uh, imaginable, but ultimately it's what governs what we can drink, what we can eat, what we can swim in, what we can climb, the parks we're allowed to go visit, um, the way our communities are structured, where our parks and sidewalks are, all these things are parts of the environmental rulemaking process. And um, as, uh, as boring as it is, it requires um, access to it is one of the most sacred things uh, in, that our democracy allows us. And it's part of the American promise really that everybody have the ability to participate in those spaces. And one of the things that fueled my interest in bringing, um, in, in raising that sort of like the participation of everybody in those processes is the fact that, you know, agroecology really um, is reliant on everybody's participation in those, um, in those spaces as well. Ecology itself is not gonna happen without human and government involvement. And it goes back to kind of what I was saying that those, those processes are on par in my mind with um, land management practices and weather and you know, your pest management scheme. Yeah. Like are the farm workers that work in this farm able to understand uh, literally like is the, the or is there actual uh, language translation for the pesticide notifications that are supposed to happen? Is there a capacity to participate in that groundwater governance meetings? Most of the time the answer is no. So um, all of those things are, the, the fallout of that lack of access is in my uh, opinion, really what leads to seeing these huge disparities in health you know, communities that are um, on the map of California, and you look at kind of where are the places with some of the worst groundwater and pesticide exposures and proximity to hazardous waste cleanup sites and particulate matter in the air, they're concentrated in the San Joaquin Valley. Yeah. Well, so you were talking about agroecology as a frame. Well, I mean, we, you know, I'm sure in the class we'll talk about it more and define it and such. Um, but I was curious, how do you see agroecology in relationship to some of these other frames that have been used uh, in, in terms of people trying to achieve change in the food system, right? So in the US, I think more often people use food justice and talk about food justice is what they're seeking. Um, whereas internationally, and to some degree increasingly here, people talk about food sovereignty. So under, what is your feeling about the relationship between these terms? And, or, or like, what, what do they say to you uh, whether it's the same or different? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a great, it's a great question, and I think it's important to mention that, of course, agroecology is a movement strategy that was not developed in the United States necessarily. It is maybe one that has been um, proliferated more recently in um, in the United States, but it comes from mm, comes from indigenous ways of uh, farming in right way with the earth, which, you know, originating sort of the, the uh, phrase itself originating in Central America and, um, and also in Brazil and uh, in terms of its migration into, into the United States, kind of in many ways relying on um, white academic conceptualizations of agroecology before it became something that I think I, I and many others here in North America uh, or in, in the United States utilize as a movement strategy. And 
food sovereignty is the, I think we, we often say that kind of food sovereignty is the praxis and um, agri, agroecology is, or rather uh, food sovereignty is the practice while agroecology is the praxis of the kind of strategy around getting to food sovereignty. Um, and food sovereignty, of course, is the understanding that all people should have access to the, the decision-making process around their food system what they eat and how it gets to them. And when there is decision-making power around the entire system, there's also decision-making power and participation in all the other, uh, as you say, invisible structures that uphold um, the food system itself. That's why food sovereignty and agroecology as a pairing in my mind are the most uh, salient, they're the most um, motivating to me to plug in and find spaces where um, I can make a difference, where I have the ability to really wrap my hands around some a project that I feel like I can do to advance the ability to, um, to improve that access to democracy. And I know democracy, you know, in, in many ways, we end up uh, equating it with this kind of electoral politics uh, formulation of what democracy is, but I, I use democracy as a, as a, you know, the phrase, the word democracy in its very elemental form, just access to decision-making. Access to decision-making for, um, uh, for more people than just those who developed the political system in the first place. And the, um, the framework food justice, as you ask is, in many ways, the maybe the first phrase that I ever heard that helped me even put any kind of vocabulary to any of this stuff that I'm interested in, food and agriculture. And I, I, I don't remember the year that it kind of became a more popular phrase, but I think it's the early 2000s. And <clears throat> food justice is more along the lines of um, you know, I guess it, it's more similar in many ways to the struggle for food access and equality in, um, in, uh, in access to food. And that <clears throat> also, of course, has a very important and, and uh, I mean, a invaluable, invaluable place in the larger movement for food sovereignty. But I think there's also, uh, I'm sure students in this class and yourself, Antonio, probably heard this phrase that one can be food secure in prison. And um, there's not necessarily access to decision making around what that food is, but you can survive, you know? Um, and I understand that in like the issue of food security and food access is a, you know, it's, it's harrowing in, in the United States, the, the lack of food access here. Um, and maybe the question of survival uh, for some is much more grave of a subject, but, you know, in terms of my, um, in, in my sort of like hopes and long-term dreams for the food movement, I hope that that survival mode can graduate to really being, um, focused on building the decision-making power that allows for long-term stability of, uh, of communities, community stability and, um, and interdependence. Yeah, it, it seems kind of like, you know, food justice would be an achievement of a food sovereign kind of food system, right? If people actually had ongoing control and power over all these different structures, that food sovereignty would be the result. Right. That's. Uh, I think that is the hope of, um, and the the dream of food sovereignty is that, the, <clears throat> the parameters. Within which that, uh, within that food system that the, within which that food system is developed is determined by the community and, um, and in my opinion that that requires 
sort of reaching to the people who have been most impacted by the agricultural system to ask, what does a healthy food system look like to you? And where are the places where there are um, opportunities for collaboration and support for efforts that are led by people who are sort of dealing with those worst impacts. And it, in my experience, you know, I've worked with farm worker residents across the state who have <clears throat> who have dealt with that fallout, who themselves struggle to even advocate against the um, the company that employs them for fear of their own uh, job security, right? So when there's when there's that level of suppression, um, it makes it very hard for the aperture of vision for um, many residents is very narrow because you're just trying to get your next meal, trying to be able to pay your next water bill. But uh, you know, a food sovereignty framework sort of is meant to open that uh, that lens a little bit wider to think what else, uh, how does this system actually get completely overhauled so that there are uh, openings for decision-making all, all across the board from management to you know personal health to family health to where you live, all of those things are a part of a, of a food system then through a, an agroecological food sovereignty lens. Uh, well, I know we have not super amounts of time left and I was curious because you've talked about, so some of your work has been focused on sort of farm worker issues. And then I know more recently you've been involved in things uh, sort of at the state level around what we're, you know, people are calling farmer equity or maybe it's farmer justice. So maybe you could uh, talk about, you know, that is another aspect of this empowered democracy, right? Like how can we make these structures actually um, accountable to or sort of reflect the needs of people who are actually deeply affected by them? So mm -hmm. yeah, how did that come about or what are, what are your sort of recent works in that? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so in 2016, I was a part of forming an organization called um, the California Farmer Justice Collaborative. And I would, maybe other members of the collaborative would not totally agree with this, but I'm gonna characterize it in saying that um, it was really kind of riding the, um, the, uh, the new administration, um, the Trump administration when Governor Newsom came into office and really like the moment at which the California state legislature was kind of just throwing the middle finger to everything that the federal government did. And there was a moment, <clears throat> I think, and we saw it, we saw our opportunity and we took it where we passed California's first civil rights bill in agriculture that identifies um, what are called under the state law, socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers, which basically just means non-white farmers. And that language- And, was, and women, right? And women. Um, so actually that's, um, the federal law does oh. name women, but we specifically in the state one decided not to include women as a special designation. And I tell you why, because uh, the federal socially disadvantaged farmer and rancher designation, which was created really like after the um, the Pigford lawsuits, which are uh, black farmers in the South suing the USDA for historic discrimination. Um, the outcome of that was this creation of the socially disadvantaged farmer and rancher program the, within the farm bill. It's called the 2501 program. Um, and what resulted from that was a number of, you know, farm organizations lobbied to get women, just, you know, categorically women added to socially disadvantaged uh, farmer status. And over the course of time, what we've seen is the ma a good majority of the farm subsidies that are earmarked for socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers or farmers of color have gone to white women farmers. Mm. So, 
um, under the state designation, we specifically decided to just keep it to um, to farmers of color, <clears throat> but really, you know, the language of the, the bill itself has a laundry list of different ethnicities that are non-white according to the federal census. So um, that's called the, the Farmer Equity Act, that bill that we passed in uh, 2017 ultimately. And that, uh, that organizational effort has grown over the course of the last three years to be really <clears throat> the, one of the first attempts that we've seen by the state to translate materials in any other language uh, aside from froze. English. Uh, we froze. Oh no. Oh. Can you, can you hear me now? Okay. Sorry, internet hiccup. No you, were, you, were, uh, you were saying about that. Yeah, yeah. So what we've seen in the last three years um, in implementation of this law has been that there is <clears throat> now at the California Department of Food and Agriculture, the first farm equity advisor, who is a executive level position within CDFA. And granted this agency, which is the agency that oversees all things agriculture in California has been around since, I wanna say 1918, mm -hmm. 1921, something, so 1920. Um, and since 1920 to now, we've not seen, you know, hardly any translation of anything uh, in Spanish, despite the fact that Spanish is the second uh, most commonly spoken language in the United States. And yeah, we don't need to talk about how the vast majority of farm labor is done by people who speak Spanish. So um, that is one of the things that we've seen. There's a uh, um, you know, just the now to have a, an office within the department where these issues are being discussed is just a completely new thing for um, for any agricultural agency. But you know, California being one that represents such a wide diversity of different um, ethnicities, it's really it's a big step forward. But our organization at our, the California Farmer Justice Collaborative is really having to just meet on a regular basis with the department and help do this kind of imaginative process for the agency to determine what does farm equity mean for, for California, for a state that is built off of the history of colonization, um, of land grants that have then given way to large white <clears throat> agricultural land holdings, um, and then over the course of time, waves of immigrants who have helped build the California countryside and give, have developed this multi-billion dollar agricultural industry that we have. How do we now like suddenly wake up in 2020, 2021 and say, well, we wanna fix this. And what does the future of that look like? So um, because you know this is kind of approaching the end of this uh, particular, uh, lecture section, I just wanted to say that if there are folks within this class who are interested in learning more, participating, um, we are currently in the process of expanding the California Farmer Justice Collaborative. And definitely there's, especially if you're a farmer, especially a BIPOC farmer, we have um, are looking to kind of build our capacity. And that means folks who are interested in communications, in policy, in fundraising, um, and also just like the administrative aspects of running the first organization that really speaks uh, for farmers of color collectively, rather than siloing us into different ethnic groups or using uh, a union to advocate. Um, this is really like the first sort of iteration of an organization that's meant to be multicultural, multilingual, multi-ethnic, and uh, organizing along those those lines, you know, um, without <clears throat> without creating those the divisions among urban and rural farmer between mm -hmm. um, the landed and the landless, 
So if uh, there are folks within the, the class who are interested, I would love for you to get in touch and um, we'd be happy to kind of plug you in on a bunch of different projects that we're expanding right now. Yeah, that's exciting. I mean, I, you know, it's so new. It's like, right, 2017 was, I guess, almost four years ago, but it seems like um, so much has happened in those four years, but that they, there was this kind of opening created by that legislation, which there still is a lot of other stuff to do, right? CDFA is a very entrenched uh, agency, entrenched in the system as it was, right? So yeah. it takes a lot of effort, I imagine, to move it. Yeah, it's uh, phenomenally, <clears throat> phenomenally entrenched in, in the sense that, you know, the agency was created as an outgrowth of industry, where, mm -hmm. um, for instance, with the California EPA, we the Cal California EPA was um, is formed for the purposes of regulation, right? I mean, we had in the state of California we had an Air Resources Board, which is a the entity that oversees air quality, well before the federal government had an, an EPA, because California has been so ahead of the game in terms of regulating our air quality and and environmental protection in general. When it comes to agriculture, I mean, there's like, agriculture is completely cut out of the majority of regulatory uh, activities. And this agency, CDFA was kind of just created to like prop up the family farm, this notion of the family farm and to create an, an I hate to put it this way, but like an, just an in-house lobby for, uh, for agriculture. So um, we're really having to elbow our way into this very entrenched institution to see if there's a space for the kind of like psychological reckoning that this agency has to go through simultaneously with putting in place policies and programs to advance equity for the for BIPOC farmers. So it kind of actually sounds like we're circling back to your first story in a way in that, you know, you have to change the structures, like the laws, the things that tell people what they have to do, but that's like the intellectual side of learning about change. And there also has to be reckoning within individuals and the agency itself as an institution need to actually go through an in, more of an internal process to be able to authentically shift that story or the, that information. So it's kind of interesting. I never I thought about that. And that's a lot of challenging long-term work, of course, when you're working with people, you know, yeah. <laughs> people. Yeah, getting, getting people to look at history is not easy. You know, I really, this, this stage in my career, I really give it up to history teachers who really like get people engaged in looking backwards because that that's really the stuff, you know? I mean, getting people to look at how we got to where we are in order to move us forward is phenomenally difficult. And it's just a, especially in government, there's just a big cognitive barrier mm -hmm. um, because look, especially looking back into the history of agriculture is phenomenally painful. Mm -hmm. You know, and our, our state is an anomaly in many ways, but we are home to many of the same exact atrocities that uh, have been reached across the rest of the United States and mm -hmm. beginning with the colonial project of this, of this country. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I mean, we have a strong preference for historical amnesia, let's say, in this country. And so, you yeah. know, that's definitely valuable work. And I think it's the first step I, one, one last comment before we let you go is that I was reading the, the farmer equity report, which came out last year, based on the sort of hiring of a person for that um, to implement, right, the, the Equity Act in various ways. And it's one of these few documents from an agency like CDFA that acknowledges historic harms against certain groups of people, right? So that's like a step from completely ignoring it, pretending it doesn't happen, not even dealing with it to acknowledging that right that's a step mm -hmm. and it, but it made me think maybe because I'm who I am like I was like huh that's really interesting and cool it would be awesome if they acknowledge that that stuff happens today that this is not a story of the past but that's a story of something that continues to the day and that it takes an active effort to address with it address it today not just redress historical inequalities which is how the language is that's the current status quo of sort of progressive policy making language so I saw that and I was like, oh, that's good, but it's an edge. It's not, it's not all the way. Yeah. 
Well, thank you so much for your time. And I really hope that uh, the lawyering goes well uh, once you get your, your paper and all that. Um, and yeah, I'll definitely, you know, we'll, we'll pass along contact info for any uh, students who want to get more involved. Thank you, Antonio. Yeah, um, I really appreciate this opportunity and I do hope that folks get in touch. Um, have a great rest of your week. Cool, thank you. I'm gonna stop.